AFIO Now is presented by Northwest Financial Advisors, where our world revolves around you. This is Jim Hughes with AFIO Now. We are a program of recorded interviews with former senior uh, intelligence officers and those who write about them. Today, I have a very interesting guest with a fascinating story. His name is Gordon Carrera. He is the security correspondent for the BBC. He covers terrorism and cybersecurity and espionage and other related subjects, both in the UK and around the world. He's been in that role at the BBC since 2004 and with the organization since 1997. And he's presented a number of documentaries and written books on espionage and related subjects. And he has a fascinating book out that I must say I thoroughly enjoyed. It's entitled The Colombo Project, The Secret Pigeon Service. Gordon, welcome to Afiona. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you, Jim. Gordon, how popular was pigeon breeding and racing in the UK and Europe kind of in the 1920s and 30s? Well, it's forgotten almost just how popular... It was. Hundreds of thousands of people were involved in keeping pigeons and racing pigeons at this time. And really, the peak of the sport was in the first half of the 20th century. People often called pigeons the poor man's racehorse. You might not be able to own a racehorse, but you could own a pigeon and you could race it on the weekend. And it had become a hugely popular sport, particularly for the working classes, but also, you know, in the UK, even the, the the royal family also had pigeons. So it wasn't exclusively working class and across Europe and particularly in certain parts of Europe, like Belgium, it was uh, it, it, hundreds of thousands of people were involved in that sport at the time, taking joy and fun in the fact that you could release these pigeons far from home and they would then race back to their home and you could see whose was the fastest. Who proposed this concept uh, at the beginning of World War II, and did it meet much opposition? Well, so the idea of using pigeons to carry messages is age-old. I mean, it goes back to classical times. Julius Caesar used them to send messages back in the days of his invasion of Gaul. And so the idea that you could use pigeons, what I call a superpower, which is the fact that they could find their way home Uh, wherever you drop them. And it is a remarkable power and still not entirely fully understood. So you can take them somewhere they've never been before, release them, and they know how to get to their home through this amazing homing ability they have. So this was understood for centuries that you could use it for sending messages. And it had been done for militaries, for communications, even for finance. But there was this understanding you could use it also as an intelligence tool, as an intelligence gathering tool, not just as a message sending tool. And they'd done this in World War I on a much smaller scale, where they'd sometimes dropped pigeons over enemy lines, sometimes in a hot air balloon, they'd literally flown it and then the pigeons would be released and they would hope to be able to gather intelligence and have people send messages back to the other side of the front lines. And so there have been some pioneering people who've done this for British military intelligence in World War I. So when World War II starts, they basically say, hang on, we might have an option to use pigeons again to use them to collect intelligence. Much more ambitious because This time, you're looking at Britain uh, sitting across the channel, across a body of water, with, by mid-1940, the whole of Europe effectively occupied or controlled in some way by the Nazis. And uh, what was happening on mainland Europe was, if you like, a kind of black box. There was very little intelligence. There were very few uh, MI6 agents who hadn't been rolled up at the start of the war. The Bletchley Park enigma work wasn't yet going. So they had very little intelligence about occupied Europe. And so the question was, could you take advantage of this ability of pigeons? And people started to say, well, maybe we could. Maybe we could drop pigeons not just across enemy lines in the trenches, but across the channel, across this body of water into France, Belgium, Holland, and see if they come back with messages. So this idea was proposed. It's fair to say there was some resistance. People said, really, pigeons? Uh, but <laughs> uh, and but they persisted. And there was a very small group of people who said, let us try this. Let, let's see if we can make it work. 
And um, again, it's fair to say some resistance, particularly from the more established intelligence agencies like famously MI6, the Human Intelligence Service. They did persuade the British military to just try it, to basically say, could we drop some pigeons and could we see if they'll come back with any intelligence? And that was the birth, really, of what became Operation Columba, uh, the secret pigeon service, run, as I like to say, by a crack team within British military intelligence. Everyone, I'm sure your audience will have heard of MI5 and MI6. This was MI14 subsection D, which is a fairly obscure branch of military intelligence consisting at the start of war of, of the war of just two officers whose job it was was to understand what was going on in occupied France and and, and the Low Countries. And they were given responsibility for this rather strange pigeon operation, but which proved very interesting. What was Leopold Vindictive and what was their role? So the Secret Pigeon Service worked by dropping pigeons by parachute. That sounds strange. But these were RAF planes which were on special duties missions. So they were actually there to drop secret agents for MI6, the special operations executive behind enemy lines. But as they did that and they flew these agents in, they would also drop some pigeons. Uh, they would push the pigeons out and the pigeons would be in a kind of canister and attached to the canister was a parachute. And the parachute would then float, uh, take this canister and float to the ground. And they would hope people would find what was inside, which was a pigeon with, with a message saying, this is a spy pigeon. It's for real. It's from the uh, from British intelligence. And the idea was ordinary people would find it, villagers, and they would then be encouraged and asked to send back intelligence on what was happening in their locality. Are there German troops moving? This kind of information. And, and it worked at the start, but there was one crucial message, and that was message number 37, which landed in a Belgian farmer's field, was taken to some local shopkeepers, and found its way actually to a Catholic priest who fell into the hands of a rather remarkable Catholic priest called Joseph Raskin, who had already had a network of friends and had done intelligence work, or at least mapping, in World War I, and understood how to draw maps. He was also an artist. And so this pigeon effectively fell into the hands of a ready-made resistance network built around this priest. And he christened this network Leopold Vindictive for some specific reasons. But the key thing was he sent back in a on a message attached to a pigeon. And so if you imagine, the message is about the size of a large postage stamp. And onto that, he, with tiny handwriting, and he'd learned calligraphy as a priest, including in time in China, how to, he put on hundreds of words, thousands of words, and even maps about what was happening, which he and his friends had, had collected, and they'd already been collecting because they hoped to do something like this. Then they took this tiny tiny piece of paper, put it back in a canister, attached the canister, which is about the size of a pen top, to a pigeon's leg, released it, and then with a ma within a matter of hours, that message was back in London in the hands of MI14D with this amazing intelligence from a group calling itself Leopold Vindictive. Uh, and it was a remarkable proof of concept of this secret pigeon service. And it showed they could gather genuinely useful intelligence via a pigeon. Did the well-known rivalry between MI6 and British SOE cause problems? And how did it affect uh, this operation? Well, that's one of the tragedies of this operation, really, is that um, it, it, it was that if you imagine that F SOE were the special operations executive, MI6 were the secret intelligence service, and then this message had gone to MI14D, the secret pigeon service. But the problem was the message was so good. I mean, it was so good that it was actually shown to Churchill personally. We know that from some of the papers that survived, that Churchill was shown this message from Leopold Vindictive. And I find that fascinating. I think the reason it was shown to him was because not necessarily of the specific intelligence it held, but because of what it represented. It represented the spirit of resistance that Churchill wanted to foster. And it told Churchill and others that at this time there were people within occupied Europe who were willing to take risks to provide secret intelligence. And so I think it was a kind of morale booster for Britain at this time when they didn't know what was going to happen in Europe. But it also made the people who'd sent that message the object of much interest. 
And of course, when there's much interest, and maybe some people will understand this in the intelligence world, there can be a little bit of competition as to who might be able to be in touch with this group and who might be able to take advantage of such a valuable group, which Churchill had heard of. So even though the message had come to this small MI14 subsection D, it's MI6, which takes, if you like, an interest in it, and it decides it wants to contact this group. So they organise for the parachuting of two agents who are going into Belgium to try and contact the group. They don't tell MI14D. And at the same time, MI6 and the Special Operations Executive are not necessarily on very good terms. And one of the things that surprised me in my research was just how bad the relations were. I think we like to think in wartime everyone was, um, you know, on the same team and all jolly chaps together in the UK. But actually, it was pretty bitter feuding. And MI6 and SOE wouldn't tell each other which agents they were dropping. And yet those agents would then contact each other on the ground in places like Belgium. And inevitably, uh, some of them would be captured or turned, which would then eventually roll up entire networks. And unfortunately, that's what happened to this one particular network, Leopold Vindictive, is that uh, MI6 sent in those agents, but they got wrapped up with other networks. And these networks were in turn compromised by the advert by German military intelligence, which ended up with pretty much the whole network being rolled up. So the sad story is that Leopold Vindictive collect and send this fascinating intelligence. They collect more on German Atlantic wall defences, uh, but they're unable to send all of it back because eventually they do get captured. Tell our audience a little bit more about Father Joseph Raskin and something about his background and his relationships. So he was a fascinating man and one of those people in history you wish you'd met. A man who in the First World War had been, it's interesting, he'd been a, he came from a kind of artistic background and had started drawing pictures of trenches while he was in the First World War. And they'd realised he had a, a skill at it as an artist. And so he'd become a kind of artist drawing maps of what was behind or what was on the front and to be used for military intelligence. He's also training as a priest, goes to China, learns calligraphy, comes back from being a missionary. And one of the things that's so interesting about him is he develops a network of people because as a kind of travelling priest, a missionary priest, he knows lots of people. He's there to kind of raise money for his missionary group, traveling around, traveling around Belgium. Lots of people know him. Lots of people trust him. Crucially, he also is in touch with the King of Belgium and the reference to Leopold uh, in Leopold Vindictive is actually a reference to the King of Belgium. And uh, one of the reasons that he's able to prove his bona fides uh, to British intelligence is that he's had contact with the King at a time when a British envoy was there. And he's able to say in one of the, in this first message, you'll be able to verify who I am if you go talk to this particular British Admiral, because he'll remember the priest. So he has a very clever way of establishing who he is. So he's a remarkably kind of skilled individual who in some ways is the right man at the right place for a pigeon to turn up and for whom could collect, write up, gather intelligence, build a network, although it doesn't necessarily end well for him, I'm, I'm afraid, and quite tragically. But I was lucky enough to meet um, members of his family who'd, who'd preserved some of his drawings and, and, and aspects of his life. Did the other side use pigeons? And were there countermeasures used by each side? So in the bizarre world of the pigeon war of World War II, I'll give you one little story, which is that uh, in Britain, they were worried that um, falcons, peregrine falcons, were killing the pigeons, bringing back messages from occupied Europe. So they had a, uh, a what was called a, a falcon destruction unit, which was part of MI5. And I always joke, this is one part of British intelligence which did have a license to kill because they were out there to kill these falcons so that the falcons, the hawks, couldn't kill the pigeons. But then during the war, MI5 suddenly picks up some canisters in Britain, which they, as they open the canisters, they realize they're not British, but they look to be German messages, which German agents, they think, who've been sent undercover into Britain might be sending back to Germany a pigeon. So suddenly MI5 swing into gear and think to themselves, we need to capture these or kill these German pigeons. So rather than the Falcon Destruction Unit, they then create a Falcon Unit from MI5, 
to train these birds to kill pigeons. And they send them onto some islands off the south coast of Britain called the Isles of Scilly, because they think they've seen some German pigeons flying over. They think back to the continent from Britain. And these falcons, they, the MI5 officers sit with the falcons there one summer. And they killed seven pigeons and they decide all of them in the end are British. I'm afraid there's no friend or foe identification for pigeons. And so it ends up killing more by friendly fire than afraid of uh, German pigeons carrying messages. So the Germans did use pigeons, and they particularly used them in some parts of occupied Europe, like the Balkans, but not as much for agents uh, as the British did. And actually, one of the interesting facts is they couldn't have used it for something like Operation Columba in the same way. And the reason being, Operation Columba dropped them behind enemy lines in occupied Europe, relying on the fact that the ordinary people of occupied Europe would want to help the British. They'd want to send messages back to Britain. But of course, if the Germans had dropped pigeons in England to try and get messages back from ordinary people, you can probably imagine the um, the expletive and other messages that they'd have got in return. How successful was this operation overall? Can you give our audience some examples of, of meaningful intelligence that was produced? So it's a good question because about 16,000 pigeons dropped and only about one in 10 made it back alive and less of those with messages. Many of the messages of the thousand or so messages, and I read almost all of the ones that I could find in the archives, about a thousand of them, many of them were almost meaningless. Sometimes they'd say, nothing here to see, please come and liberate us soon, signed a French pe peasant. Sometimes they'd have interesting intelligence, but there were a few. So there's Leopold Vindictive, this message number 37. But I'll give you some other examples of really interesting intelligence. Was There was a man called R.V. Jones, who was head of scientific and air intelligence attached to MI6 particularly. And he was interested in German radar. And they realized that British RAF and eventually American aircraft were being shot down over occupied Europe. And that the Germans were able to scramble fighters to intercept them and shoot them down. And they realized they had some new way of spotting them. And they understood that this was some of the German radar systems. And what they needed to do was locate these. And they realized that one of the ways of locating them was through the pigeon network. And so one of the questions they asked, and they had a questionnaire for people to fill out who found one of these pigeons, was, have you seen any unusual structures? And people would say things like, there is a strange metal structure which ro rotates in the forest three miles west of here, of this village. And of course, what that was, they didn't know what it was, these, these French or Belgium or Dutch workers or peasants, but th this was a radar station. And in a number of cases, the only way German radar and other military installations were spotted and then attacked and destroyed was because of the intelligence brought back by the pigeons. So you can see some real tactical intelligence from particular resistance groups and from sometimes really just ordinary villagers who just see something and want to tell someone and take actually huge risks in doing that. And what was the fate of the members of Leopold Vindictive? Well, I'm afraid it's a tragic fate, which was the fate of many agents in World War II, because they got wrapped up with resistance networks, with escape networks, with other human networks trying to send back messages, which eventually were penetrated. So they were arrested and Joseph Raskan and others were executed in a pretty terrible way, I'm afraid, and in quite a shocking way. And in quite, a, I mean, still, I find it quite genuinely tragic to think about what happened to that man. And of course, it was the fate of many others who took brave decisions to resist. But that was the spirit of resistance. And these people knew what they were doing. They took the risks. They understood the risks. And I think they did it in in faith that what they were doing was what they believed in and it was valued and you will you know find that these people were hugely valued by british intelligence and by many of their compatriots as their stories began to emerge after the war so it is that terrible story of resistance and it's terribly sad what happened to this particular network which was captured but but they did provide some intelligence which was, as, as I said, not just a tactical value, but was a morale booster. And, and it was this ability of the pigeons to somehow connect people, to connect Britain at a time when it was didn't have any insights really into occupied Europe, when it didn't know what people felt, and to connect them in turn with people who were desperate to resist and who wanted to take the risks to resist and were looking for a way of doing it and wanted to feel some that there was someone out there perhaps on the other side of a body of water of the channel, who wanted to help them. And the 
pigeons, strangely, were the mechanism by which these two sides could be in touch. Well, the book is called The Columba Operation, The Secret Pigeon Service. It is a fascinating read. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I want to thank both uh, Gordon Carrera and also the BBC for bringing it to us. Jim, well, thank you. It's lovely to be able to talk to you about what is a wonderful and little-known wartime story. 